Hi everybody, it is 7.30, so that means it's time to talk about slaying some dragons and how to find your fairy tale, whatever that might be for you. Uh, I'm sure some of you as you're heading into work maybe especially have sat there and said, you know what? Um, I would love to quit my job and I just wanna travel and see the world for, for my life. But what if instead of your life, it could actually be your living? I met a guy named Lee Abamonte because Twitter the algorithms showed me his profile because I like to follow a lot of travel or blogs and their adventures and essentially maybe even live vicariously through them. So I started to follow some of his treks around the world and he's joining us now from New York City. Hey, how are you? Hey, what's up? How you doing? Uh, for anybody who's down here in Tampa, we're having some epic thunderstorms I'm looking at out my window. It's kind of my favorite time of year around here. It's so dramatic and just moody this hour. I mean, it's like the skies are opening up here. What, what's going on in New York? How are things right now there? Uh, honestly, things are as good as they've been, uh, you know, since pre-COVID. I mean, uh, everyone's, you know, it's it's warm. It's it's nice. Everyone's outside doing stuff. Um, you know, listening to the rules, wearing masks, socially distancing. Uh, all, good. All the good stuff that we're supposed to do. That's why we've had such success in dealing with this whole thing. But uh, you know, we're just uh, worried that it's going to come back. Just like uh, we just don't want to go back to where we were in March and April because that was just a nightmare that's hard to. In a weird way, I think uh, the nightmare is what's probably going to make New York turn around maybe faster because you saw the worst of it. You lived the worst of it. So yeah, it yeah. definitely shut down what what you do. So yeah. for people who aren't familiar with you, um, I, I met you on a story because I in, in my reporter life, I cover how to save time, money, and stress. And I thought it was a pretty cool thing that you could make money while traveling. And I picked your brain on how you made that possible. But for this, I wanted to back up even more and talk about how that even became something that was feasible in your life and why you love to travel so much. Take us back to when you were a kid. I mean, where'd you grow up? Did you travel as a kid? No, I never traveled as a kid. I'm from uh, Trumbull, Connecticut, which is about uh, 50 minutes outside New York City. And, uh, you know, I just, regular kid, just played sports, hang out with my friends, all that kind of stuff. I never left the country until I was 20. I did a study abroad and that kind of changed everything for me, uh, you know, perspective wise and uh, kind of opened my eyes to things. But I always like read a lot and I always like knew geography and memorized maps and stuff as a kid. I like lists and I like uh, having goals and accomplishing things. So uh, travel was kind of like a uh, an easy kind of segue uh, for me into kind of accomplishing things and seeing things. And uh, when I first got to London and my study abroad, I was just like blown away that, uh, you know, they spoke with an English accent. And uh, <laughs> it's different. They drove on the other side of the street. It was so weird. And then um, went to Paris and, you know, they speak French in France. And uh, it just kind of blew me away. You know, it's like one of those things that until you actually – experience it you're like ah they don't really talk it's the simple things that you know to be true but then when you're actually living it you're like oh my gosh this is so amazing because this is their everyday life yeah yeah and uh you know it just kind of was crazy to me just traveling around europe with uh with my best friend and then doing um you know crazy things like Oktoberfest and you know day of the dead and like all these things and drinking in ireland you know when before you're 21 it was like awesome you know <laughs> and uh it, it was just an experience, and then it just kept getting um, more and more, and I just kept loving it more and more, and, um, you know, and here we are 22 years later, and, uh, you know, in theory, uh, I'm doing this for a living, even though uh, the living has is, is been cut recently, but um, it's, it's been, been a pretty strange. Yeah, strange times, but you started traveling, and I think, I mean, I, I ask you this because I'm, I'm pretty blunt when it comes to the questions that I ask. I'm like, oh, come on you probably are, you know, independently wealthy and you just travel the world on your private jets and you said, whoa, 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 everybody says that about me and I really wasn't that rude. But hey, you know what, it was, it's people's inner dialogue because when they see somebody who established the record for being the youngest American to travel to every country in the world, they say, how in the world did you have the money to see the world? And you said, listen, I worked for it. So yeah. take us back to that point, because if somebody has a goal, you said you love lists, you love, you love maps, you have this goal in your head. How did you make it financially possible? Well, I mean, I worked my whole life. I mean, I come from no money. Like neither of my parents, you know, had any money, trust me. And, uh, you know, I went to public school, just like most kids, uh, at least where I grew up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I had a paper route. 
like when I was six or seven years old and I had that for like eight or nine years. And then I like mowed lawns, raked leaves, washed dishes, shoveled snow. I, I know in Tampa, you guys don't know what that is, but it's. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I lived in, I live in Tampa for a reason because I shoveled a lot of snow when I lived in Boston for 15 years. So but, yeah. But like if school was canceled, I would shovel snow like for 12, 15 hours a day. And we charge like, you know, 20, $30 per driveway. And it was like amazing, you know, and me and my best friend would just trudge around through, you know, 16, 18 inches of snow, just, just doing yeah. it for ladies and uh, whoever else we could get to pay us, you know? And um, yeah. And then I just kind of worked odd jobs through like college. And, uh, and then I worked on wall street, right. When I uh, had a school, I started a business as well. And uh yeah, it's just a good run. I mean, but I also never really spent money on anything. Um, I, you know, I didn't do anything. I didn't like anything really besides sports growing up. And uh, maybe I'd buy pizza or like, you know, tapes, you know, like cassette tapes back in the day. You know, roses but you something. weren't a big spender. You were frugal. Would you say that that valuing an experience more is kind of what shaped you and pushed you towards spending on travel when you did have extra money? Yeah, and I didn't even know I did. Uh, it wasn't until I started traveling that I realized that value experiences over things. You know, I mean, I just grew up you know, without money, so I just always thought I'd like to have some money. And, uh, you know, but then travel kind of opened me to spending on different things and realizing, uh, you know, we aren't, we're only here for a short time. Uh, you might as well live your life while you can, you know. When did you find out that you were, you were a record-setting traveler or on the way to being that? Yeah, it was uh, actually 2006. I just climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro with uh, my buddy. And uh, at that time, I'd been to like 110 countries or something like that. And we spent like three weeks like camping in Tanzania, like in the Serengeti on Kilimanjaro. And then we were in Zanzibar for like two weeks or whatever. And um, he sent me an article a couple weeks later. He read about this guy in an airline magazine who had the record for being like the youngest to go to every country or whatever. And I was like, you know, I kind of took a little look at it and he was like 15 years older yeah. than me, like that and I was like man I'm already halfway there I never thought I would go to like Somalia or like Iran or you know Iraq or something like that but I was like what the hell why not do it and uh, ironically I'm, I'm pretty good friends with the guy now and oh, uh, funny. yeah and like so I sent him an email and then I, I flew out to San Francisco to like basically like take him to lunch you know just kind of talk to him I thought he was gonna hate me and we became pretty good friends <laughs> That's awesome. So basically, like, hey, I want to break your record. Yeah. And then what happens? I mean, when you when you break a record, what happens? Do you get a, an official letter in the mail? <laughs> and see, for me, it's like different than it is now. Like you see people doing these records now and they're getting like certified by Guinness. They have like, yeah. hundreds, you know, that type of thing. So they're trying to get on. TV. And like when I did it, I was just doing it just to do it. It was just mm -hmm. fun. I wasn't I ever expected to like make money on it never expected to be doing this like as a job i mean it wasn't a job back then i was like one of the to help make it a job you know and mm -hmm. uh, you know so for me it was just kind of trial and error and uh just see what happens and uh kind of go from there. but no i didn't get anything just kind of bragging rights i guess and uh yeah i never even tried it, it wasn't like hey guinness you want to certify me it was kind of like okay i did it cool now what you know <laughs> that's funny you know, if somebody is setting out to do something like that, it sounds like, you know, you were just doing it from an honest place of, of passion of something that made you tick. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody then gets halfway to a goal, do you have any suggestions on how to then turn it into a plan? Well, it's it's different now because, like, people have kind of shown you the way. And, and like, yeah. people come at this from like, all kinds of different angles now. And, uh, you know, with social I wasn't on social media back then. So, like, media and everything like that um, has kind of changed everything and uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can attack it now but there's also so much competition you know and there's so many people doing this kind of stuff and if we're talking about like every country yeah you know I, you know when I did it I think like 60 people in history had ever done it you know and I was the youngest like you know pretty much uh, certainly American by far and uh, and after that it was now people are doing it like at like 22 years old or something like that you know with money from their parents or their crowdfunding or, you know, they're just getting everything. Crowdfunding. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of different ways to, to fund, yeah. to fund a daydream, to fund your way to, to happily ever after. A lot of people would say you're living a fairy tale though now, because through the, the notoriety that you got from breaking this record, um, you were able to partner with different brands. You know, they said, Hey, you're going places, check out our, 
our cruise, check out our travel insurance. How did that work out for you? And did that come as a surprise? You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, back in like, I think it was 2011 when I set the record, like I was just like, all right, cool. Here I am. I did this thing. Now, now I guess I got to get a real job now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden American Express uh, reached out to me and they uh, said they wanted to pay me money to basically like be myself and like talk about, you know, what I did and like all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. You know, sure. And, so that's a thing. All right. <laughs> and, you know, never really like gone on TV before or, um, you know, uh, done any public speaking or anything like that. And then I started doing that. And then, um, then I realized like, maybe I got some here. And then I spent about a year kind of just going to conferences and like networking with people. And, uh, you know, before you knew it, um, I had contracts with uh, three or four different companies. And, you know, you're back to making like, you know, real pretty good money, you know, and, uh, and then it kind of went up from there. You said, yeah, you've been to places that you didn't expect. And obviously, you've been to every country in the world. Is there one that surprised you the most as a place that you we're going to check the list and then we're really struck by either the culture, the beauty, the, the history. Well, I could take this in a ways. I mean, um, I would say Libya was the most surprising because the people were so nice to me. And that's actually the country that I like had the, the craziest experience in because I actually yeah. got at, uh, in, in the car I was at, like going to the country. Was, I, I need like 20 minutes to, say, to tell you the story, but it was pretty wild. Um, so a lot of places in Africa are like that. Um, places like Namibia. Uh, Wait, we're gonna we're gonna do challenge accepted. We're we're gonna do the story not in twenty minutes, but I know you have it in you to summarize because you've done a lot of TV. So, so just the story is is what what shook you from that? Well, yeah, real quick, I was at one hundred ninety two countries. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's like little fence thing just fell. Um, he... <laughs> Does that mean the dog is out? Do we get to see the dog? Uh, he's not home yet. He's uh, he'll be home soon. Um, anyway, he um, I was at 192 countries. I had to get to small. Libya was the only one I had left. It was the Arab Spring 2011. No fly zone. All this, you know, Benghazi. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I found out there was kind of a um, uh, hey, Crystal, what's up? Uh, I found out there was like a, a loophole or whatever to get into uh, Libya from the border of Egypt. So I, I, I flew out there and. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do. I had like five grand in my pocket. I figured I was going to have to like bribe somebody or whatever. And uh, I found a guy who looks like spoke English. He had a Libyan rebel lapel pin. And uh, so I asked him if he could help me get a taxi to the border. He asked me what I'm doing. I tell him, he goes, are you out of your mind? And I'm like, well, yeah, obviously I'm here, aren't I? So uh, I probably. Right. And it's not, and, and you were doing it in a sense to, to hit a goal that you didn't, you did, it wasn't like a live or die goal, but you're going to a place that has um, some strife, to say the least, at that yeah, moment yeah, in time. Voluntarily going to Libya during the um, war. And I was there, like, I think it was two days before they actually killed Gaddafi. And uh, it was pretty wild. Anyway, um, I, I ended up with this guy whose brother came in from Libya with a minivan. Uh, we, I like, yeah, I'll take care of you. No problem. And I'm Okay, cool. I didn't even think twice about it. I got in this car with this guy, uh, this Arab guy who I'd never met before. And uh, we drive to the border. We're about the border, about 30 feet away. On the other side of the border, there's many smugglers trying to smuggle some fake Marlboro cigarettes from uh, Libya into Egypt because they don't have to pay the tariff because there was no um, uh, government at the time. And the Chinese and then the Libyan rebels start arguing and then they start shooting at each other. And uh, the car I was got hit at three times times and I'm I, now I'm with these two guys who I don't know and long story short um eventually got through and I ended up guys for a couple of days and they really took care of me but um man so that was how you hit the last country on your list by yeah. getting hit by bullets went out with a bang yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you know but you said that that people were so nice to you and I think that that's a huge misperception you know I've traveled a lot because my dad's from India so growing up I would go there every year and we ended up stopping in, in a lot of different places in the world along the way than, than many people would have. And it never occurred to me that, that people wouldn't be friendly because I saw it everywhere. Yeah. But there's obviously, you know, a lot, of, a lot of politics that can get in the way, a lot of misperceptions. What do you think is, is the biggest takeaway for you in terms of, of your perception of what it means to be American as you're traveling? Well, it's it's really gone through stages, to be honest, and um, and I say that because of the way American politics received overseas. And mm -hmm. uh, I started traveling during the Clinton presidency, 
and everyone liked Clinton, right? And then I my traveling during the Bush presidency and everyone hated Bush, right? So it was like, oh, how and Obama becomes president, everyone loves Obama, right? So all of a sudden everyone loves Americans. And now it's a disaster and everybody is just like, how do you guys have that guy as president? And you know, so it's just like, it, it, it varies a lot politically around the world, how Americans are perceived before they know you, you know? So this is like when, you know, and then they'll be like, oh, you're not like a typical American. And then you're, oh, you know. That's what something. is a typical American? Yeah, what is a typical freshman? What is a typical Englishman? What is a typical Nigerian? I mean, people have, stereotypes that we try to get ahead of all the time. Um, when, when you thought how your life would go at, at any given point, did you think that this would be it? This wasn't a thing. I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> was never a job, you know what I mean? And so when I say I talk to people about how they found their fairy tale, what I'm finding a lot is the fairy tale found them. You know, a lot of people just did what they loved yeah. and the path to making that be a lifestyle kind of started to roll out you know, the, the carpet just started to roll out. Like, this is the way that you're going to go. Yeah, I mean, that was it. I mean, it was just following your passion. And I started my website to document, like, what I was doing back in, like, 2006. I started the site, which seems so long ago. And I guess it is. Um, but, you know, and the thing about the Internet is people read. So, um, you know, it kept me uh, motivated, I guess, because people who I didn't know were, like, following along. With me. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, this That's Internet how I joke, I, we, right before you signed on, I was like, yeah, the algorithms told me to, to follow you because I followed a ton of travel bloggers. Yeah. And then I was like, huh, this guy's traveled to every country in the world. He seems pretty young. Oh, look, he's the youngest American to travel to every like that was your claim to fame. So I think that, that that's just what happens. It's something, you know, you strike people's interests and then they start following your adventures. Um, would you say that, that you have found your quote unquote happily ever after, this is something you could do forever? Well, before COVID, I would have said yes. Yeah. Uh, so now we're kind of getting to uh, to see where we're at here. So um, the answer is I don't know. I mean, I imagine no matter what I end up doing, whether it's just keep doing what I've been doing or, you know, kind of pivot a little bit, it'll be somewhere in the uh, the travel sphere. And, uh, you know, I have so much knowledge in my head just based on experience, you know, that there's definitely some value there. So, so we'll see. But um, – yeah, travel and sports and, uh, you know, like golf and just doing stuff, you know, experiences. I mean, that's... Uh, Again, the living the fairy tale. You don't even know what you have, mister. You don't even know. Hey, yeah. I want to say, though, as people are, are saying hi and good morning, um, wherever you're... Good morning. That means you're, you're watching from somewhere far away and cool if it's good morning. Um, but ask questions. I know that you probably feel like you'll, you'll field questions if anybody wants to, to participate and hang out and ask you anything. Um, you know, the whole point of this is how do you, how do you build the life that you want to live and how do you set the goals that, that you want and make them actually be attainable. But the other part of it is slaying your dragons and, and dealing with doubt. What has been the, the, one of the biggest obstacles for you in terms of either what you've done in, in traveling or things that you've seen in the world that, that made you upset or feel dejected i know sometimes i feel like when i travel i see things that i want to fix and i can't and and i get so thrown by the disparity that it's hard what's hard for you yeah and what's up scott and uh paris or pyongyang i mean come on now uh right. scotland pyongyang hello awesome <laughs> uh, um you, you know you, you is, is this your is this one of your travel guys is this the guy he he wanted to know or she wanted to know um who it was earlier. They wanted to know whose record you actually beat. Oh, this guy, Charles. Um, okay. I'm sure I, uh, uh, Federer, by the way, definitely over Rafa. Um, what's up, Indonesia? And uh, yeah, so, you know, you can't save the world. You know, that's the thing. And it's like, um, you know, but what you can do is um, set a good example of what it's like to travel kind of responsibly and smartly and, uh, you know, get in touch with different things than people are used to and in, including like cultural experiences and like meeting real people and doing things and then sharing it. So the way I look at it, like I said, you can't save the world. The normal tourist goes to a place, takes pictures of the usual stuff, you know, post it on their Facebook page. And, you know, you kind of go from there. I try to like do things a little bit differently. I also go, go at things from a different perspective. So I share, try to share how I see things and how I care about them and, uh, you know, just do and have fun with it. 
And, um, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, you, you go to impoverished places like, you know, places in India or Africa or something like that. And you just want to adopt every child there, right? Like, save everybody. Yeah. But, you know, you can't do that. But what you can do is bring that to the forefront of, um, you know, your, your trip really and, and share it with people. You have a, a bit of a platform. And that, that's really what I try to do. So, and uh, thanks, Angel. Antithesis of a travel douche. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, so, you know, there's just so much that you can do and, um, and, and showcase when you travel, especially these lesser known places, like a place like Iran, right? Like when thinks, oh, Iran's a bunch of bad guys, you know, and uh, they're the enemy. That, that's like one of the nicest places, you know, people are so nice there and dying to go back there, you know? And uh, I only had, I think five days there or it was. And like, I, I, you know, it's the top place I want to go back to because I had such a great experience there. And uh, north of India, by the way. And um, where, where is, where's your family in India? Calcutta. Calcutta. Oh. Yeah. I was literally just talking about Calcutta because the best Thai food I ever had in my life, shockingly, was <laughs> in Calcutta, India. <laughs> okay, so we, my family talks about all the time here how in Calcutta they make the best Chinese food. So yeah. it must be the same, like Thai Chinese. My theory is that they just must be throwing a lot of Indian spices in there and doing like a good amalgamation. So we're getting like some fusion maybe, I don't know. Yeah, or yeah. if they cook anything like my dad and now me, it's always when you're not looking, they're putting a little bit of sugar in, making a little oh. bit sweeter. <laughs> and so that's the secret. All of a sudden those vegetables that you're eating that you thought were healthy, yeah, somebody got in there and put some sugar, <laughs> some sugar and some hot pepper, but. For me, yeah. the spicier, what was that? <laughs> for me, the spicier, the better. Oh, for me too. For me too. I mean, if it can clear your nose and make you sweat, that's a good meal. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what was what was the craziest thing that you've ever eaten? Speaking of meals. Um, <laughs> you know, I get asked this question all the time, and like it, my go-to answer is uh, generally, and it's exactly this: it's things that I don't actually know what they are because I didn't want to know because then I wouldn't have tried. So. <laughs> And meaning like animal body parts, insects, what? Yeah, like, like stuff in China, like in the market, like where Corona started, you know, that kind of crap, you know, like, like stuff in night markets and street food markets around the world, especially places in like India and, and China and d different places where, you know, you don't speak the language, you don't know like what things are and, and someone's trying to show you around and you're just, you don't want to be rude. So you eat and you're like, oh shit, what was that? <laughs> I, yeah, something's fried and salty and, you know, battered. Don't ask. Just don't ask. What about yeah. the best? Was there, was there a meal that blew you away that you still remember? Oh, my God. So many. So many, uh, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible to choose one. I, I t I'll tell you this, and this is kind of my, uh, my better answer on this. If I was going to die tomorrow and I had one meal left in my life, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be in Naples, Italy, in Napoli, a place called Damichele. And um, the pizza there is... It's so good. It's so good. You can suck on it. That's how good the pizza is. There. And <laughs> I dream about it every day, and I can't wait to be able to go back to Italy because I've been there every day for the last like twenty years. I'm thinking of like a poor, soggy piece of demolished pizza. Now you made it not sound appetizing with that visual. Although I get what you're saying, you want to take every last morsel out of it. But I'm like, Ugh. but yeah. I mean, you you remember the stuff like that. There was. There was this dessert that was, I don't even know what it was, but they were making it fresh in the south of France when I was biking there with, with my best friend from childhood. And we smelled it in the air and we followed it. And it was, it was like a pastry that was full of cream that was ice cold, but it wasn't ice cream. I still don't <laughs> know what it was, but I was like, give them all to me. And I still, I'm not even a big dessert person, but that, that is in my memory forever. It's yeah, funny yeah. how food does that. Yeah, I mean, especially in Europe. I mean, France, Italy, uh, Greece, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, anything in the Mediterranean there. I mean, they're all just tremendous, yeah. you know? Oh, great food. You're getting harassed. It says, really, ma'am, pizza for your last meal? This is a guy named Mark. Yeah, it'd be my first meal, last meal, and every meal in between. If it... <laughs> hey, you love what you love, right? Maybe I'll throw um, some in there, too, but that's about it. <laughs> what about when it comes to people who who are, are listening to this right now, they go, okay, awesome. So you had pizza in Naples. Giovanni's talking about, you know, this amazing dessert um, that, that she had. Oh my gosh, San Trapezian tart. That's what it was called. It just came back to me. Right. It was a big old mouth. I'm like something fancy sounding. But 
I think the point is that I tried to make at the beginning of this is you, you're a very, you know, normal person. So am I, we came from normal families. We didn't have somebody handing us a passport and an unlimited credit card saying, go see the world. That's what we right. save for. I mean, I even remember that, um, I, I kept thinking like, let's remodel our kitchen and we would save to remodel our kitchen. And it was a, it was an ugly kitchen. It was like, you would, you would cut an apple on one side of the counter and the other side would go because it wasn't even attached anymore. There was sponge paint. That's how we bought it. We were always going to fix it up. But then I would say, or we could go too. So we lived in that ugly kitchen for a very long time and I don't regret a, a second of it. So I think it's about putting your resources where it matters. But for someone who thinks that's impossible, what are some steps that they could take? Maybe it's, maybe it's traveling globally. Maybe it's just seeing something awesome in the United States in terms of making the plan. And let's talk about it like COVID's gonna be gone. Let's, let's think, you know, post pandemic, because obviously this is a weird time. Well, here's the thing. I grew up in a hideous yellow kitchen, by the way. So I hear you on that one. <laughs> You know, I think we remodeled it when I was like 12 years old or something like that. And we had, we got an island and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And, uh, an island in a kitchen when you're a kid, that's the coolest thing ever because islands are just awesome in general. <laughs> and hey Val, what's up? My next trip is uh, Vegas and I'd love to come back to uh, Stockholm as soon as possible. And Angel, I think you were with me at Diamond Kelly in LA. Totally not, but, um, you know, they licensed out the name. Uh, so what the hell was I talking about? We were talking, what were we talking about? How to, how to make the plan. Oh uh, yeah, so. Um, there's so know. many, there's so many friends to talk to and pizza to discuss. I mean, here we are, we got an eye on the prize here. So somebody who wants to live a similar fairy tale as yours um, for, you, for you gotta the planning purpose. Yeah, you gotta figure out what you wanna do. And like, you know, I always tell people save your money because you know, anyone who talks about travel, they're like, oh, you could travel cheaply. You could travel cheaper now than you ever could. Mm -hmm. But you know, you still need money. I mean, let's be honest here. And uh, anyone who says you don't is full of shit. But um, so save your money, determine what you want to do, what's important to you, you know, what parts of it you you really want to, uh, to do and you can't miss. And, you know, ask around and, and, and see what's missable, because some things are, are not worth, you might think that are, you know, and you go out of your way, you spend some time, you spend some money. So develop a budget, save your money and figure out where you want to go. But when you when you talk about travel, it it's the best thing you can do. It really just makes you a better person. It makes you uh, um, a better person. It makes you more informed because you can speak on a variety of topics from firsthand knowledge. And the way I look at myself is I'm like an ambassador for the American tourist. So like when I meet people and they're like, wow, you're actually smart and you're not an asshole and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, most Americans are not. You know, it just might be the ones you see on like Jerry Springer or something that you know but because they love jerry springer and other places big deal <laughs> and it's embarrassing anyway um but yeah hey you know what sometimes pop culture precedes us in terms of what is you know what has trickled out for our reputation so well that that's why america is popular in the world is because of pop culture because of movies and, and music but especially because of movies because they don't make movies in albania you know what i mean albanians watch american movies that's a lot of the time where they learn to speak English and uh, why they think of America first, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's important to remember that stuff. And then, uh, you know, especially when you go to kind of less developed places, they might not have ever met American before. And, uh, you know, that's when I love it because then you get to really kind of represent yourself uh, the way you think it should, not the way it's perceived without people actually knowing. Yeah, I mean, I think about my, my mom went to India. She'd never even been on a plane before she went to India when she married my dad and went out to his village that was at that point, I mean, down dirt roads and you had to go the final stretch by ox cart. That's how you got there. So they had never seen someone who was of whatever mixed up, you know, kind of English European mix she is, good old American. Um, and the little kids would all come out to just stare and even just, touch your skin and when you've been in a moment like that and even even when i would go there you know there's a lot more now with with tv with cell phones with uh, the availability to kind of have this cross pollination but when i was little i remember being like the attraction for the day it was like what is this person who's walking through our city it, yeah. it's a weird feeling have you been like have you been the oh, yeah. the only person to look like you in in a city in a village in a place 
Well, the, the end of that Libya story was that um, after we got through the border, I ended up staying with that guy and his family. And they hadn't seen their mother in like 40 years because of Gaddafi. They were dissidents. And then they insisted that I stayed with them. And entire family, like 50 freaking people or something like that, were there. And no son was home visiting, you know, for the first time in 40 years, seeing his mom. All they wanted to do was stare at me and like ask me questions and practice English and take pictures with me and, you know, that type of thing. It was like the weirdest thing. And, um, you know, but at the same time, it, it was like heartwarming, you know, and um, I had experiences like that in, in many different countries, uh, especially countries is, is where you really get it. But again, you know, I, I, I look at that as kind of a badge of honor. You represent your country and yourself um, yeah, because you, it's your responsibility. You might, you might be the only person from the United States that they ever meet, you know. Has that changed the way you encourage your friends here? to to act uh when it comes to to their their world view really i mean it's easy to live in an echo chamber or vacuum or, or see your own views and just we get busy too so i, I think sometimes a world view is, is lacking yeah i mean you know i'm pretty fortunate most of my friends uh travel you know yeah. um most of my best friends uh travel with me or on their own or both you know, I, I, I love that about them. I think five or six people that I've been to like more countries with, you know, which is yeah. I mean, like, so you know, you've got your, you got your pack. You're literally, you know, birds of a feather flock together. A couple questions that are coming in from, from people who are watching right now. One was if you can expand on what you mean by traveling responsibly, responsible travel. And then the other one um, might be even, even quicker to answer. Do you keep in touch with people that you, that you meet when you travel, like those guys in Libya that meant so much to you, that family. Yeah, that's the advantage of like social media, like Facebook and stuff like that. It's like a phone book you can't lose. So you can just become friends with somebody and there they are. So like, yeah, uh, yeah. I see what he's doing. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, we chat every once in a while. His daughter's actually in New York uh, at NYU. So, I, you know, I see it sometimes. It's, it's pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome, yeah. Yeah, and uh, must see countries in South Africa. Um, I mean, they're all good. They're all good. Argentina is like one of my five favorite countries in the world. Bolivia is the most underrated country in the uh, the Western Hemisphere. And what makes uh, you say that? Mountains, food. Yeah, it's just so much to do, and like the uh, Southern Altiplano is amazing, and then uh, in Peru is just tremendous as well. So, and really, you can do all three of them. You can start in Peru and then end in Argentina. And it's super easy. Uh, Colombia is also another one that's great, but. Um, yeah, traveling responsibly, just uh, like I said, um, do do the right thing and uh, represent yourself, uh, your nationality, and uh, and don't be an asshole, you know, and, and, and like... Respect uh, the culture, respect the culture yeah, respect that you're in, yeah. The places, you know, learn, and, and have knowledge before you go there. That's a big mistake that people make is like, half the time they don't know anything about where they're going. They're just going to kind of like tick it off, which is fine. But at the same time, you don't really get an experience there and you don't appreciate things and uh, know what you want know what you want to do know what the customs are and just be honest with yourself but also try stuff that you've never tried before you know throw yourself out there that's part of travel right yeah absolutely it is i mean I, my, one of my favorite things to do when i travel is to figure out who will let me cook with them whether it's a restaurant or a hotel <laughs> and, uh, you know sometimes i get i get myself in over my head like okay i thought i was gonna learn how to make lunch for myself and then I'm wondering, like, why am I still straining vegetables? And when you strain, like, vegetables to make vegetable broth, this was in Costa Rica, you are, you've got the cheesecloth, you're blending it, you're, it, it was eternal. And, like, then this much broth comes out. Like, okay. And I was doing that for a couple hours. And then I realized that we were making lunch for the entire hotel. So, you know, it was a rainy day, a good way to spend a day. I learned how to make awesome rainforest vegetable soup. And now I know how much it takes to make that broth. But sometimes you're like, okay, how do I, how do I wrangle myself into this yeah. one? Yeah. <laughs> were there any, uh, on that note, were there any situations where you're like, oh boy, I'm in over my head? Aside uh, from getting shot at on the border of Libya, because we kind of started off strong here. Uh, I've honestly, I've never felt over my head in anything I've ever done in my life. Um, yeah. Definitely confident in every situation. So um, I've never felt over my head. To be honest, and uh, what, what, what's what, that like? What, what, <laughs> I said, "Wow, what's that like?" <laughs> situations that I've never been in before, and then you know, seeing where it goes is the way I look at it. It's all part of experience, both good and bad, you know. 
yeah, you, you learn, you take away from it. Yeah, when I say I end up over, over my head most of the time, those are the, the times I love the most. And I'm left laughing like, okay, like typical Sorbani. Um, so uh, what about environmentally friendly travel? If, if somebody wants to, to really focus on, on green travel and being conscious in that way. I mean, green, you know, I, I'm, I'd be lying if I said I was the, the go-to authority on uh, green travel, but you know, like, like I said- I'm sure you, but in your, in your group too, your travel friends too, I'm sure there are places that are just, you know, the eco lodges that really do it right and the trips that, that do it right. Yeah, for sure. And like, you know, don't litter <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, respect the environment, um, all that stuff, just basic common sense stuff. I mean, you know, people talk about um, limiting your carbon footprint and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, you do the best you can. But the way I look at it, like those plans are going to go whether you're on them or not. So but just don't create stuff like, you know, private planes and things like that that are unnecessary. I mean, you, you know, you do you do the best you can. And um, but and always stay aware and, and respect people in places and of course the environment and, and don't fucking smoke. I mean, anyone who smokes is an asshole. <laughs> no offense to anyone um, smoke. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I've been I've been making these these very inspirational takeaways from all of these and and would would you like that to be yours? Don't effing smoke and don't be an a-hole. Yeah. XOXO, like, so, so, Lee Abamante. That's a very Lee quote, so <laughs> That's a quotable quote. Um, yes, got- I, I would say that. Hey, so what's your favorite fairy tale? My favorite fairy tale? Uh, Come on, go way back. You were a kid once in what? Trumbull, Connecticut? What did you say? Yeah. Uh, in, in, in snowy Trumbull, Connecticut, when you watched a Disney movie or your parents read you a book or you picked up a story, what was your favorite? Uh, I like the giving tree. Do you remember that one? It's not a fairy tale. Not- <laughs> but it's a good story. I do. It's Shel Silverstein. Yeah, that exactly. was cool. So we, we can roll with that because if anyone's familiar with that one, it's about this this tree, right? That that essentially takes care of the kid his whole life. He yeah. he plays in it, gives him apples. He swings in it. He cuts it down though and builds gives, a house. Yeah, but he uh, he the tree told him to cut it down to like uh, you know for the wood or whatever. It all came full circle, and in the end, he ends up going back to the tree. And uh, you know, I just always remember that being a great book. And yeah, Shel Silverstein, I like him and Dr. Seuss. I guess Jack and the Beanstalk. That's a fairy tale, right? It is, and that's funny that you said that because if you were, I was thinking like, all right, if you didn't have one, what do I think of for somebody who likes to travel? I mean, what Jack bartered a cow and came home with some beans, and his mom was pissed. She was like, "Why would you give away our cows for some beans?" So there's like Lee parallel number one. You might come on and be like, all right, sorry, sold something, got less, but I have a master plan. There you go. And then a giant beanstalk grows, and what does the guy do? He climbs it. Doesn't know, <laughs> doesn't know what's up there, but decides to climb it. Exactly. What's up, Drew? Uh, I was in Mogadishu with Drew. Um, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. I, did, I want nothing to do with politics. I would not fare well in politics. I, I would just tell everyone to fuck themselves. <laughs> so. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that that politics is nef- necessarily um, the place for you. I would say nope. you're, you're doing. Yeah, nobody's climbing the beanstalk and going and fighting the giants. Maybe. Yeah, there you go. If you were smart, you wouldn't go into politics, which is why there's nobody smart in politics. Just think of it that way. <laughs> you might be too opinionated for politics. There's also that. Sounds like you're a little bit opinionated. Um, okay, so so here's my here's kind of my my last thought on all this. The idea of traveling the world, why do you think people think it's so unattainable? Uh, because people are unaware. I mean, if you haven't tried it, you, you know, you just think, oh, it's expensive and like, can't go there. It's far, or, like whatever. And, you know, it's just like anything else in life. You kind of have to experience it firsthand and just throw yourself out there. After a trip or five, you really kind of have the feel of it and uh, you kind of know what you're doing. You feel more comfortable in and it, and it really just gets in your veins and you just want to do more of it. And, uh, you know, they call it the travel. But that's really a thing, you know? Oh, I definitely think so. The more you see, the more you want to see. The mm-hmm. more you do, the more you have to do. Yeah. Once you realize there's, there's so much more, more out there, you know? So for somebody who wants to, to make that first step, it's just decide, right? I mean, it's, it's decide, budget the money, go, and just go. Just go, just do it. You know, um, you know, I've been saying this for years, nothing to it but to do it. And, 
you know, once you do it, it, no one's ever said, oh, I traveled. That was a big mistake. You know what I mean? It's always like, oh my God, it was the best thing in the world. Like, I can't wait till my next trip. Most people are already thinking about their next trip when they're on their current trip, you know? So no one's ever like, wow, I went to, um, I went to Paris, but that place sucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's never been said. So, you know. Yeah, I think that, that once, once you get that, that taste, you know, you just keep going. So as just, far as turning it into something that became, you know, your, your lifestyle became your livelihood. I mean, that's, that's an example of your pathfinding you in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All Where right. So, put yourself out there. And back. Yeah. I, I'm, I, you went to study abroad and then it all just went from there. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have a dog gate that you need to fix guys. If you're listening now, he had like, you know, I'm going to blame, I'm going to blame the operator here. A, a shoddily constructed um, dog gate was, was crashing down and you've got probably dinner to eat and all of those things. So um, thank you for hanging out with us. You're welcome. And uh, Richard, I'll be in Las Vegas on Monday. So uh, yeah, I expect it to be hot, but uh, what are you going to do? It's the death. <laughs> it is. <laughs> hey, so you're traveling again. Um, what do you think, you know, actually last note before I let you go, um, how's it been looking on airplanes and in terms of safety and masks and distancing and all that? What, what would be your advice to people who are really like, Oh, I don't want to right now. I think I've flown about 25, 27 times, some, uh, you know, since May. And uh, it's been great, to be honest. I mean, I'm also super careful about the flights I get on. So I, you know, check all the seat maps and uh, choose my seats wisely. I use points to upgrade. And if I have to pay mm -hmm. to, uh, to keep distance. And I've been flying airlines like Delta and JetBlue, where they block the middle seats. The middle seat, yeah. Or in first class, they only sell one of the two seats. So you're as distant from people as possible. You wear your mask of course, and then, you know, they, they either hand out or you bring sanitary wipes, wipe down your, your plate. And um, honestly, I mean, just mind your business. I mean, if you travel responsibly, you should be pretty good. And, uh, you know, just don't like lick anything or anything stupid like that, you know? Yeah, you know, it's, it's always tempting to what? Lick the tray on the, on the airplane? I mean, where are you going with this? Um, so <laughs> you do have to be careful. You know, I think you don't realize how much you touch your face and the things that you touch and Listen, uh my dog is back so i have to go this has been yes. a blast Thank you so much and uh it's great seeing you by the way and hopefully i'll see you in nice tampa to see you soon. too yes next All time right. you're traveling through tampa we'll pick your brain again and you know see what you're up to in the world of news travel covid insurance saving money whatever it is uh thank you go hang out with your dog because that's what it's all about in COVID times right thank you bye everybody Good night. Thanks for watching, everyone.